Saguaro National Park, covering 92,000 acres of the Sonoran Desert in southern Arizona. This landscape may appear barren and uninhabitable. However, it is in fact teeming with incredible biodiversity, including at least 19 species of lizards. Larry Jones, also known as the Lizard Guy, is a wildlife biologist who has dedicated his retirement to studying these lizards with a particular focus on two charismatic species. I sat down with Larry and joined him in the field on a hot Tucson morning to learn more about his life and career, as well as his current project of monitoring lizard populations in this stunning landscape. My name is Larry Jones. I'm a wildlife biologist by trade. I'm basically retired, although I do have a uh, small job right now working with reptiles. And I spend most of my time looking for lizards. Well, I grew up in Southern California, um, but in about half my adult working life, I was working in the Pacific Northwest. And there I studied uh, salamanders, and Pacific Martins, which are fur-bearing mammals. And I studied those um, mostly in Oregon and Washington State for about 18 years. And while I was doing some of that, I was also, well, I was studying salamanders that uh, live in streams and near streams, like in the Olympic Peninsula and the Washington Cascades. Then I got really tired of the rain and the snow. <laughs> So I decided, somebody said, if you really want to live in Arizona, why don't you try to get a job there? So I went online and I found a possible job. So I came out, had an interview, and I nearly got the job as a state herpetologist. Um, I was number two, so I didn't get the job. <laughs> and about a year later, I decided to try again, and I was working for the research branch of the Forest Service. So then I moved to, or I got a transfer to come to Safford, Arizona. And so I lived in Safford, Arizona for about a year. Um, that was in 2003. And I then, after about a year, I moved to Tucson. I went to work at the Forest Service uh, Supervisor's Office. Then I retired in 2014 and have been doing lizard surveys or lizard work since about 2003. My lizard study has two overarching themes. One is the effects of climate change, uh, which when I started this it was kind of novel, <laughs> but now there's lots of climate change research going on. And the other thing is uh, how ecology, roadside ecology of lizards, because something I've noticed ever since I was a kid really, was that lizards like to hang out on berms of roads. And um, so when COVID came along, I thought I want to do a, a lizard study here at Saguaro National Park West. And later I also did Ironwood Forest National Monument. So uh, I was looking for desert iguanas. Uh, because somebody had mentioned that desert iguanas are one animal that's doing really well in the face of climate change because they're the most heat adapted lizard or vertebrate on earth really. They have the highest known uh, voluntary body temperature of any vertebrate on earth. So I came out to Saguaro National Park. I drove around a little bit. I saw a bunch of the lizards and that's, I thought, well geez, I should start doing this regularly. 
and then I started seeing a lot of long-nosed leopard lizards, which are common in some places like the Great Basin, but they're really quite rare in the Sonoran Desert and Chihuahuan Desert. So I was pretty excited to see some of those, and I said, well, if I'm going to study the desert iguanas, I want to study leopard lizards too. So my work is twofold. One is just cruising roads slowly. People think of road cruising and think of how to look for snakes or uh, toads or turtles or something. Uh, but you hear very little mention of it for lizards. So it's road cruising, but I'm really looking at the berm. So it's kind of like berm watching. I call that technique, I fish, I made the technique official by calling it low speed road transect and published a little bit about doing it systematically. And so I'll be doing that later today. And so that's a, the two overarching themes. And so I've got a lot of data on climate change. I was actually, the 2003 surveys I started out in Safford area, uh, it has the highest diversity of lizards in the United States of America. And I did 12 years of roadside surveys there. And then I moved the operations over to Swarrow National Park. And this is year six of these surveys. So what is the value of understanding the, uh, the roadside ecology of these lizards? So what I'm trying to do is, is long-term monitoring. So I'm trying to do as many years, what I do is I go out weekly and for as many years as I can do it and see the changes through time and then correlate those with weather. So for example, uh, when I was out in Safford, at a certain point, the number of lizards was really consistent. And then we had some back-to-back -back droughts and the numbers dropped dramatically and they never seemed to recover. Although no species were ever lost. So I'm trying to do the same thing here in Swarrow National Park. And we do find the effects of drought because winter drought is kind of the norm under climate change. And this time of year, this is the monsoon, this is a, a season when we get most of our rain, especially during climate change. So today is going to be, should be a really good day for looking for lizards because it rained last night and lizards seem to love the rain. And the other thing I'm doing is from my early days working on uh, Pacific Martins, I really love doing radio telemetry because you can really find out a lot about an animal from radio telemetry. And so I caught some desert iguanas and put transmitters on them first. Now this is the first time anyone's ever really done a field, uh, field work with radio harness desert iguanas because they're kind of notoriously difficult <laughs> to work with. Um, but I got some really interesting results. And then the, the next year I decided I needed to put some radios um, transmitters onto the long-nosed leopard lizards. And uh, some folks have done that before, and there's a lot of work being done on short-nosed leopard lizards, blunt-nosed leopard lizards, because they're an endangered species. But I'm finding out all kinds of information, and they're much easier to work with, and they're a little hard to find, but once I find them, I can get a collar on them, and I can always re-find them and uh, take the collar off as needed. So everything I'm learning about leopard lizards is almost, it's kind of new, <laughs> so it's pretty interesting. This year there's a focus on where they sleep at night, and uh, if they sleep during the day, the heat of the day. So I have some volunteers, and I send them out <laughs> in the heat of the day. Sometimes it's up to, you know, 107 or something, and so it's kind of rough, but they take lots of breaks and stay cool. Uh, and we are kind of tracking what goes on with leopard lizards. So do they just come out once or do they come out twice? Do they use daytime burrows? How do they use those burrows? Do they reuse those at night? So there's many questions we're trying to answer this year. So say I am complete, I'm a total lay, lay person. Okay. What would you say to me to make me think that uh, desert iguanas and leopard lizards are cool? Okay, so we'll start with the leopard lizard. I think they're cool because they're really tough animals. Um, so every time I catch one, they usually, almost every time they bite me, they bite really hard. So they're kind of neat. They're actually, they're not an apex predator, but they're a, uh, they actually eat other animals that eat other animals. So 
Um, that means they're kind of a high level predator, even though they're not huge. You know, certainly a, a hawk or a snake could take care of them, but they also eat other lizards. And I have seen them eating their own young. So that's, that's kind of a bad mother response, I think. But the theory is that the adults go into brumation or hibernation before the juveniles and the juveniles stay out for a while after they go into hibernation. So they avoid contact that way. But if they're at the same place at the same time, the little one doesn't have a chance. So the desert iguana, uh, it's really a, it's the most primitive iguana in the world. And it's kind of a strange looking thing. It's, a, it's a fairly large, has this blunt little head. And that's why you can't put a collar on it because it would slip right off. <laughs> and then they have fairly short legs. And they are one of only two animal or lizards that are vegetarian primarily. They'll eat uh, like caterpillars. I love caterpillars. But most of the time they're eating some sort of uh, fruit or leaves. They, for example, they love swallow fruits. They love uh, creosote flowers. Right now the spiderlings, they're just lots of spiderlings out there in some areas and they're eating those. So most other lizards eat um, insects. That's kind of what they do. So they're really different animals. And then I mentioned that um, the desert iguana has the highest known voluntary body temperature that's ever been recorded by a vertebrate on Earth with uh, several recordings of 47 degrees Celsius. And in Fahrenheit, I think that means really hot. So I don't know exactly what Fahrenheit is, but it's hot, you can look it up. I seem to be infatuated with the feeding ecology of the long-nosed leopard lizard. Um, just a few weeks ago, I saw these lizards really alert. And so we've, uh, Shane and I have seen them numerous times leaping up in the air and catching a fly on the wing and they do a flip but they had a very high success rate about 50 percent and then this year we saw them doing that also but i also saw them tracking cicadas that were flying through the air and so i was watching this one and this cicada is just like buzzing along and the leopard lizard which can run on hind legs called bipedal running it came running after it and was watching it the whole time and then it stopped and i didn't see what happened to the cicada but then all of a sudden, this leopard lizard takes off again and actually runs up a choya to get a cicada that landed about this high. And how he did that, I don't know. Of course, I didn't have a camera on that, but he honestly just ran and jumped up, grabbed the cicada and leaped down and proceeded to munch it. And then just watching them hunt is really interesting because uh, we've recorded many new observations of their behavior and they do strange things like moving their head and then wagging their tail um, and trying to figure out some of these things i think there's much more to their feeding ecology and hunting ecology that i hope to uh, unravel this year they're kind of hard to we need a smoking gun of them eating something to show that uh, some of these things are happening what would you tell somebody who doesn't care about why we should try to conserve lizards like these guys and and just reptiles in general. Reptiles in general. So there are a lot of folks that are afraid of snakes. That's a very common phobia. But very few people are afraid of lizards. And actually many people like them. And so you see a lot of uh, lizard artwork. They're kind of, well, everybody knows what a lizard is. We're very familiar with them and we see uh, some of these really cool artworks, you see horned lizards and iguanas and geckos seem to be all over the place. But, so we're, we're kind of familiar with lizards. They're also an ideal study animal for a whole variety of reasons. One thing I've uh, tried to make happen is lizard watching. So people are familiar with bird watching. So you can do lizard watching just as easy. You get a pair of uh, like close focus binoculars and we can go on walks. So. Many years ago, I started a lizard walk in Sabino Canyon, and it's still going to this day. It started with urban youths. So the idea is that uh, youths that just pretty much stay indoors and play video games are not really experiencing the real world, and they're, they're getting a deficit of uh, natural life. And so we would 
bus school loads of them and then take them out on these lizard walks. And they got very excited about this. It was a really successful. And then they all get a free poster of the lizard that we saw. But aside from that, um, ecologically, lizards are very important. We think because they're primarily insectivores, so they eat insects. And they are basically a barometer of the health of ecosystems. So when you see, especially something like a desert iguana, which is a higher level predator, if they start to disappear, then something's going wrong with the ecosystem. So there's not enough food for them, there's not the right kind of cover or the like. For example, there's a study done in the Tucson Basin, and I believe there's like 12,000 lizards detected, and zero of those were long-nosed leopard lizards. So they're pretty important and uh, they, they could disappear. So they are barometers and they're just important in the food chain and they're also kind of like little sausages because everything out there wants to eat them. Snakes eat them, uh, raptors, birds of prey eat them, roadrunners eat them. Uh, so they, they have a tough life out there. Let's go look for some lizards. All right. <laughs> so, when we're driving on the road, we're trying to document a little bit of information about each lizard that we see. So it starts with the species, of course. And then we want to know if it's on the right-hand side or left-hand side. So we make a, a note of that. And in this case, most lizards are on the right-hand side because that's the side that gets the sun in the morning. And then for the trying to figure out the ecology, <clears throat> of their roadside ecology is if they're on the berm of the road or if they're on the road itself or if they're on the edge which is higher up or if they're in the uplands. So there's really a road and roadside bias because that's what is visible to us. But these lizards seem to seek out uh, the berm and water diversion, open areas like that um, because they can pretty much carry out all functions such as they can uh, have their dens in there they can breed they can find food because uh, usually the plants and the, uh, the insect life is usually greater on the berm and lizards are very aware so they tend to not be on the road because if they're on the road they see coming they leave but if they're on the berm they just sit there which makes them very detectable and then we're also looking uh, to see where they bask. So a lot of these lizards in the morning are out basking. Uh, for example, the zebra-tailed lizards tend to bask on cobbles, whereas the desert iguanas tend to bask just on uh, the sand and gravel. And we're also trying to look at um, where we find them in relation to where the sun is shining. And we have one there. Looks like a shedding zebra tail root. A That's ugh. on the berm. And then if there's any other observational notes, we can take that. So sometimes we see animals feeding or we'll see them mating or something like that.